Hello, it's James from xrobots.co.uk. Star Wars is really good, isn't it? There's going to be a new Star Wars film. So I thought it was time that I did some Star Wars projects. Now, I know I've got lots of projects on at the moment, mainly including my 3D printed alien xenomorph suit and my Iron Man Hulkbuster project, which I've been doing on every other Tuesday. Today, this is a main Tuesday build video, but it's about Star Wars instead. So lots of people think I shouldn't take any more projects, but it's all okay, because lots of them are 3D printed, because 3D printing's really good as well. I've actually got some more 3D printer capacity arriving, so I'll be able to produce more content using 3D printing. So I'm going to be doing some Star Wars projects that are mainly 3D printed. So let's have a talk about those. The first Star Wars project is going to be a new R2-D2, or probably an R6 droid, which is very similar but has a much more pointy head. And that's going to be almost entirely 3D printed where possible. There's various reasons for doing it that way, which I'll come on to shortly. The other project is going to be my lightsaber project, which I gave a bit of a preview to a prototype of how it's going to work several months ago, and I haven't done anything on it since. So the aim was to have a lightsaber with an extending and retracting blade that lights up with sounds in. So there are lots of lightsaber toys, like the one I had at the beginning, which spring out on a spring, but then you have to push them in manually. So I've come up with a way of making a lightsaber which will extend and retract and has light and has sounds and obviously it's powered which is quite hard because there's not much space in the handle so let's have a look at a preview that i did a few months ago and then i'm going to explain how it works um so here's my very crude prototype i have to stress this is a very very crude mechanical prototype only for the blade um you know the, the the hilt of this is made of cardboard basically it's got uh, the switches and the wiring are still on the outside the buttons to make it go up and down the blade is actually taken from um, one of the telescopic hasbro lightsabers um, i had to put this plastic cap on the end so the blade sections cascade in the right order and the smallest one doesn't just fall down the middle of the blade when it goes back in um so you know, I've got um, a bit of plumbing pipe on the end there and a 3D printed ring that I made to make it the right size. But ultimately, this is just to show the mechanism for the blade going in and out. Um, there's no lights in it, there's no sounds in it or any other features. Alright, so let's give that a go. There we go, and pretty much the uh, buttons will make it operate up and down. So although the prototype didn't have any lights and sound in, there is actually plenty of space in there for fitting lights and sounds. Um, and that's, that'll become apparent when I tell you how it works. So I've actually got the thing here. You can see it's got the two switches on, which control the blade going up and down. Um, and actually inside, um, it's almost entirely hollow. There's a small grey spacer in there. I don't know if you can just see that, which uh, basically guides a rod to push the uh, blade in and out. And the way it worked was I actually had a backpack on with a big motor in that unwound a coil of flexible nylon. It was actually 3D printer filament. Um, and that went down a tube down my sleeve. It went in through this hole and actually pushes the blade up and down. Um, so there's not much in the handle. It's pretty passive. The only um, culling feature is this magnetic coupler made of three magnets, which is linked to the switch. And that couples when you put the lightsaber into the appropriate hand. The magnetic coupler couples with the thing on your wrist, so the switches can power the motor. Uh, for the same reason, we can easily put lights, really high power LEDs into this. We don't need to worry about the power source, because the power source can be a battery box on your belt, because it's not attached to the handle. And we can do the same with the sounds, so we don't even need a speaker in there. We could put the sounds anywhere, and if we want to put a speaker in the handle, we can. We just have a magnetic coupling, so the sound generation board and the power source are elsewhere. So fortunately, Jedis have quite baggy sleeves, which means there's plenty of space for the pusher mechanism. So it's all magnetically coupled. There's also a magnet in the end of this blade so that the pusher-puller rod can pull the blade back down. And of course that means you can take away the lightsaber and holster it, leaving the mechanism on one wrist. And when you want to use it, you put it into your hands, as I did at the beginning of the short demo video there. The magnetic coupling couples to the thing on your wrist and um, then the switches start working and you've got the pusher mechanism to operate the blade. So the thing I had in the prototype, I'm not even going to show you because it was very, very crude and massive, made of a huge motor and a long piece of wood. 
The plan is to build a more reduced sized version of that, which just literally fits on one wrist. It really only needs to be a pinch roller that pushes the rod out, which is going to be a piece of nylon 3D printer filament again. The main thing I'm waiting to actually uh, get this done is the ability to print a custom telescopic blade, because this one's pretty ropey. So that's going to mean printing nylon, which needs a higher temperature hot end on the 3D printer. So there'll be more of that coming up shortly. And let's have a look at the R2-D2 project. So this is my R2-D2 that I made some years ago in around 2008. Now, uh, this is one of the first big props that I built, mainly because I fancied an R2-D2. So there are some plans that you can get from the Global and UK Astromech Builders Club. I'll put the links in the description. There are blueprints for all of the parts um, and various different ways of making them. So some of the frames are styrene, some are metal, some of them are wood. There are people who trade amongst themselves in the club for all of the detail parts. Some are resin, some are machined aluminium. This particular droid is a very low budget one. It's sort of built to the plans in terms of scale, but a lot of the parts are quite crude because I basically carved them out of wood and vacuum formed plastic over them, like the shoulders and bits and pieces on the legs. So the, the edges are rather rounded and some of the details are missing. So I'd really like to go back and do almost a proper job of it, but I want to do something a bit different to everyone else. So first of all, let's have a look and see what's inside this droid. All right, so this is a static droid. It doesn't have any motors and it doesn't do anything. It's got a few flashing lights and things on it, but that's about it. The head of this one is plastic. It's made from a bird feeder dome, which is a dome that you put over a bird table to stop squirrels jumping on it. And inside it's got um, some rather crude electronics and some bits of wood and so on. Um, that's the cable there that powers the logic lights. There's another one around the back. Um, various other hollow projectors and things that light up. So inside this droid, it's um, an entirely MDF frame. So I just grab the camera off here. Have a look inside. We can see we've got um, various wooden uprights and a wooden bottom and these circles that go round the outside. The frame, uh, sorry, the plastics on this are plastic. The skins, these are all styrene, one mil styrene that I cut out manually with a knife. I did a relatively good job, but it's, you know, not perfect. And we can see here, like this is a few years old, the, um, some of the plastic split. And I've got various details missing off the legs and so on. And my detail parts are all resin cast that I bought off eBay. Um, some children have pushed them in at shows and things. There are some details missing, like this is actually bottle tops instead of the correct power coupler feature. So, I'd like to do a better job of building a new one, and I'd like to make one that's remote controlled, so it can drive around. A bit like some of the ones that I saw at Milton Keynes, where I was exhibiting recently. Let's have a bit of a look at some footage of that. I want one that does that. That particular droid actually belongs to another guy called James, who's a member of the UK R2-D2 Builders Club. Have a look at my Milton Keynes Collector Mania vlog for more information on him and his droid. That droid's made of various materials and quite a lot of work has gone into it. It's controlled with a PlayStation 2 controller um, with some add-on electronics. It's got Arduino in it and some other things. So I mentioned I want to do something a bit different uh, with the one I'm going to build rather than just going and using the plans, making a wooden or styrene frame getting the skins, cutting them out again. You know, I might as well do an RC conversion on the one I've got. So my plan is to make most of it 3D printed. Several advantages to that. Obviously, we don't have to make solid parts. So if I make a frame, some people make them out of sheet of styrene, which can be 5mm styrene. If I make the, all of the plates 3D printed, and I only use 30% infill density, I can make my frame three times lighter. And in fact, if I make all the parts, 3D printed, I can make them probably three times, or if I only use 10% infill, I can make them 10 times lighter than resin cast parts. So there's quite a lot of weight saving there, which means when I come to put motors in it, I don't need such powerful motors to drive it. 
Now I don't need such big batteries to drive the motors which makes it even lighter. So in terms of transport and the features I can put in, that's going to make it quite interesting. What I really want to do is to have a 3D printing showcase to see if I can build a structure that big out of just 3D printed parts. Obviously I'll have to put some motors and electronics in um, and I'm hoping I can make a rigid structure that's purely 3D printed. The frame, the legs, the dome, everything. And I even want to 3D print some drive belts using NinjaFlex to actually make the drivetrain to drive it along. I'd also like to make it convert from two to three legged mode like it does in the movie, which means it has to suck its centre leg up inside. And some people build droids that do that, but there's obviously some other mechanical challenges, so I'd like to make all of that mechanism 3D printed as well. And the other thing is I've seen some droids being built. Some of the other droids there didn't have their covers on. It's quite good. It's almost a shame to cover up the mechanics and the electronics, and um, some of these are quite a work of art inside. So my plan is not to actually put skins on, but to leave them off and only put skins and features in certain places on the frame to help hold it rigid. So the end result is you can see the mechanical workings of the inside of the droid. So it's really more of a demo piece than a finished prop. Um, just to top that off as a prop, I'd like to have a Jawa riding on it who perhaps surfs on one foot all the way around. Perhaps he's got wires that come out the head, so it looks like something from the movie. So let's have a look at some CAD. So I'm using Autodesk 123D Design as usual, which is free software you can download for absolutely nothing, although it isn't open source. Now, here's the frame I've designed for my R2-D2. So um, all these parts have been drawn in here. It took me quite a while to draw all of the parts. Just turn off the ground plane so we can see the base. So I've got this hole through the middle for the centre foot to um, extend and retract, but I haven't built the mechanical mechanism that does that yet. Um, basically this is built in a fairly traditional way, so we've got um, circular rings as with the MDF one that I just showed you and some uprights. The difference of course being that all of this is going to be 3D printed and it's going to be printed in about 30% density so it's three times lighter than if it was solid plastic. Now with the styrene frame they typically use 5mm styrene as far as I can tell. What I've got with this one is um, actually two 5mm plates laminated together in most places. So if we have a closer look at... Uh, one of these pieces here we can see we've got um, a red and a blue piece which is two layers stuck together so in fact my frame is going to be twice as thick at least as a styrene frame but it's going to be 30 percent solid so it's going to be three times lighter so in fact it's actually going to be 60 percent of the weight of, of solid plastic and i've also got these extra tabs and things on the uprights so you can see these triangular shaped pieces to help keep rigidity when there's no skins on. So the styrene frames are fairly wobbly till you put the skins on and then that makes the droid really rigid. I'm not gonna be putting skins on all the panels. I've got some pieces like um, these bottom square brackets which hold it together left to right. And similarly here, these purple things aren't finished. That's where the arms, or should I say legs, are going to hinge. I haven't put the, the hinge mounts on there yet. And obviously they need to be powered as well so that we can do the two to three leg conversion. So um, this will be printed on my 3D printer, which is a Lulzbot Taz. And it will just about fit on the printer. So the droid is um, approximately 450 mil in diameter. And I've divided this up into quarters, which will fit on the print bed, which is about 30 by 30 centimetres, so 300 by 300 mil. Um, and this is in several layers, so if I just hide this blue layer, underneath is a red layer, and you can see the divide is in a different place to the blue layer. So the each layer is made of two pieces stuck back to back, and the seams in each layer are in different places. So the, that makes it nice and strong. And the same with the uprights, the green and yellow pieces are separate pieces and those are all cut into lengths which fit, fit diagonally on the print bed so that we can print them all out and then we can acetone weld them together. I'm gonna to print it in ABS which melts in acetone and we can put the whole frame together. So I've also made allowances for some of the features. So for instance, at this bottom corner here, let's just zoom in. I've actually missed off the corners, these triangular pieces you'll notice on the bottom along around the blue plates, the corners are missing and that's to allow the features to fit into there and that's one of the coin returns uh, which fits in the frontmost section pointing towards the screen at the moment and further around we've got one of the pocket vents and those are entirely square so there's no corners but um, by nature of having those things filled in there, that's going to make that section quite a lot more rigid, so we don't need the extra reinforcement. 
Similarly, right down the middle of the droid, in that very middle section, we've got the um, two vents, which are actually going to tie the two sides together and give that some more dimensional stability. So we don't, again, need to worry too much about the rigidity there. And once we've filled in lots of the panels, if we need extra rigidity, then I'll just put some more panels on. I quite like to have um, the arms and things come out of where the doors fit, uh, whether I actually put a door on or not, or whether I just put a piece of mesh so you can see through it. Um, it's going to be rather interpretive of the original droid, rather than um, terribly movie accurate, as I say. Now, there's some discussion over what size the droid should be. The diameter of this is exactly 450 mil, which is 18 inches. Um, so there are some more accurate dimensions than that in the R2 Builders group. So uh, a lot of people do buy the dome though. They either get um, a lampshade from Ikea or B&Q in the UK, or they buy a bird feeder dome and then they measure it. And then they build the frame to that, taking into account the thickness of the skins. So I'm actually gonna custom make my head. Um, so in this case, it doesn't really matter as long as it's approximately the right size. But I am going to be publishing this, um, the actual source here, the actual project in 123D. Once I've put the frame together and it works, I'm going to be publishing it and I'll be publishing the future parts. And I'm going to give those away for free. So if you want to make it fit a different dome, all you literally have to do is go and zoom in here, select one of the faces. Let's just get that. And then um, basically go and press and pull and you can go and stick another 10 mil on or you can go and put on a really silly measurement of some other accurate amount if you want to go and pull that in and out to make it as accurate as you want to match your skins and to match your dome so i'm actually going to print some of this and see how it turns out i'm not going to get through printing all of it in this video um, and this project is going to pop up occasionally as I've printed it due to the massive amounts of 3D printing. is isn't going to be very interesting to see um, sort of on a weekly basis printing very, very similar parts. So let's kick off the printer and see what comes out of it. So here are a whole bunch of parts that I've printed. Um, some of these, for instance, these ones took about 40 minutes and some of these took around an hour and a half. Now they're all 3D printed with 30% infill as you may have seen on the video of it printing. It's um, a rectilinear pattern inside, which is a crisscross pattern. And these are all printed in ABS, which means we can weld them together with acetone. Okay, so my 3D prints are all pretty good, uh, but in order that they butt up to the next part properly, um, I'm just basically going to rub them on some sandpaper here, so I'm just taking the edge, just doing that to it so we get a nice smooth edge, and then these pieces all uh, fit together really, really well, which makes a nice tight edge that we can acetone weld together. As I mentioned, I'm putting these together back to back, so the piece that was flat down on the print surface will stick to the next layer, so those are perfectly flat, and the tops are not stuck together. So um, the first thing I'm going to do is put together the stilts, and then I'm going to plug those into these pieces. So these align properly. And then I'm gonna stick the next piece together. Then we'll turn that over and put the next layer on. So I'm gonna be using acetone to weld these together, which I've got in a pot here. And I'm gonna be using a paintbrush to apply it. And that will very quickly melt the surface. I mean, we can chemically weld them. I've also got another pot here, which is some white ABS dissolved in acetone, uh, which we can use as a gap filler, but I'm not expecting to need too much of that if we um, clean the edges up and prepare the parts properly. So I'm just going to take some acetone and spread it onto there, making sure these are nice and clean and there's no dust or bits of green off my cutting mat on them. So I'm just going to spread that liberally on there, on both pieces. And stick that back to back with this counterpart, making sure it's the right way around. The hole's not quite in the middle. And that should stick pretty quick. I just need to make sure those are aligned properly. I'm just going to put some clamps on to hold that. There we go. We'll just leave that for a few minutes to set up, and I'll do some others in the meantime. 
So one of those is all stuck together, that's nice and good. So I'm now gonna stick these into this layer so that I can get this alignment correct. So um, I've basically ground my edges off already on the sandpaper, and I'm just gonna go into these corners here with the file, which has got a serrated edge. I'm just gonna make sure that I've got those corners nice and clean so this piece can slide right up to the edge. It may need a bit of that edge taking off, now these are together like so, do that to both edges, and just check that goes right up to the edge there so we can fix that in and then these pieces fit together properly. So that looks like a pretty good fit, so let's get that stuck on. So those bits are stuck together but my base is still in two halves and now I've got these pieces which bridge it so these go effectively underneath so that they bridge the gap in the seam here and the seam in these is bridged by these whole pieces. So what I need to do is stick these two halves together and then get this, these parts aligned underneath and then we've got these edge parts that goes under there and that makes up the whole shape to make my thickness 10 mil and to make sure the part's really strong. So what I'm actually going to do is stick these together edge to edge to start with and then I'm gonna stick those bits on the bottom once I've made some chemical welds here and here. So I've got my one piece on there, and now I've got this piece, which of course goes here, and it bridges the first seam line, which is here, and obviously these sat the side pieces which fit on here. So we'll get those placed. I think I'll do the sides first. Looks like everything lines up and my corners all match up on the inside. Now perhaps I'll do this piece first, then I'll put those on so I get my corners perfect here. That's probably the best idea. So with all of these pieces, basically I've just gone and Got some acetone, you don't need too much. And just put that all over the part. And sandwich it on and stick some clamps on. It will never ever come off because it's a chemical weld, so you have to be really careful that you've got it in the right place. So we'll just put some clamps on, align my corners, make sure my edges all line up. If I Thought about this, I'd have put keys in so that they only fit in one place, but I didn't. But you could obviously modify the CAD drawing to put little notches in so things only fit in one direction. All right, let's let that set up and we'll put the sides on. So that piece is all together. Um, it's looking incredibly rigid actually with those laminated sections. It's um, not, the acetone hasn't quite gone off yet, so I'm not gonna bend it too much. But essentially that's the very bottom of R2. Um, where the centre foot comes out. And then we've got um, the next piece, which is the actual whole size of R2-D2. So this is our 450mm diameter. It's got two flats on it, and those are there where the battery boxes um, basically fit each side when it's in two-leg mode. My other R2 didn't have those because it's fixed in three-leg mode, and I was too lazy to put them on. So this is actually the whole size of R2-D2. And of course this piece plugs into those two slots like so, um, and then we keep building upwards. So um, this is as far as I've got with 3D printing so far. I'm not gonna stick these together just yet because I need to do the layer that sticks onto the back of those with the splits in the opposite position. Um, so we're gonna come back and put the rest of this together in another video. All right, so I actually um, stuck, went and stuck the whole thing together, at least that one layer, that's only a five mil layer. There's another laminated layer to go on top, so there's a bit of flex in it, but I'm actually pretty impressed with that five mil layer, just stuck together on the edges. Don't know how it would stand up when the whole thing's there with the legs on and everything, but um, altogether this is actually pretty rigid. I can kind of almost bend the bottom layer a little bit, um, but it's quite rigid because of those sort of side pieces. So um, I think this is gonna turn out pretty well. Obviously it's only 30% solid, so it's pretty light. I think I'm gonna get out under three kilograms for the whole frame. So we might get out uh, around 10 kilograms for the whole droid, perhaps with its legs and all its other bits on. Um, obviously plus motors and batteries, but um, yeah, it's pretty lightweight and all the parts are precision produced by the 3D printer. So I've got quite a lot more 3D printing to do, but I've already bought in a big stock of white filament. So um, normal programming resumes. Um, actually Friday's video this week is gonna be the missing alien video that should have been today and um, the next week will be Hulkbuster on a Tuesday as usual. So um, I'll be doing some more information in my channel about new 3D printers and bits and pieces and upgrades, so look out for that. 
And don't forget to check back for the rest of R2-D2 and also the lightsaber project in the future.